Welcome to Reeducated TV, where we keep you informed. Today, we will take a look at the relations between the Almoravids, the Hebrews, Mohammedans, and Christians in Spain. We have covered the origin of the word Jew and Hebrews, the people, their journeys, the transition of their religion and customs from the inception. No stone was left unturned. Now you can safely say that you know the true history of the Jews, the root, right? The truth. Now you don't have to believe anymore. You know for sure. Let's take a look at the dynamics of the Hebrews and others in Spain. Let's start with the Almoravids. The Almoravids were a imperial Berber dynasty that was centered in the territory of present-day Morocco. But the Almoravids is said to have emerged from a coalition of tribes that came from today's Mauritania and the Western Sahara. They were a coalition of tribes believed to be Lamtuna, Gadula, and Masufa nomadic Berber tribes. The Almoravid is tied to what is called the school of Malachite law, called Dar al Murabitin, said to be founded in Sus al Aska, modern day Morocco, by a scholar named Wagag ibn Zalu. Ibn Zalu sent his student Abdullah ibn Yasin to preach Malachite monotheism to the Sanhala Berbers of the Adjar, present day Mauritania. Hence the name the Almoravids, which comes from the followers of Dar al Murabatin. A ribat is called Murabit. A ribat is an Arabic word for a military base or fortification built along a frontier during the Arabs' conquest of the Maghrib or conquest of the Hebrews to house military volunteers called Murabitun in Latin. Shortly after, they also appeared along the Byzantine frontier and is said to have attracted converts from Greater Khorasan, the area that would become known as Al Awasim. Now, Al Awasim was the Arabic term used to refer to the Arab side of the frontier zone between the Byzantine Empire and the Umayyad and Abbasid. Almoravids in Cilicia, northern Syria, and upper Mesopotamia, which is said started from the 700s or 8th century. Now, it is clearly obvious that the Byzantine Empire and the Almoravids or Moors worked together hand in hand. You should also note that the Moors occupied Turkey, northern Syria, and upper Mesopotamia from the 700s. So languages traveled both ways. The Almoravids was a army, military, or you can say a religious legion that was established to reinforce their religion called Malachite monotheism. But at the same time, the Byzantine Empire had fully established themselves throughout Africa and Europe. The Byzantines were Christians or polyphysites and the Moors were monophysites. Monotheism is or states that in the person of the incarnated word there was only one nature. Polytheism is the belief in or worship of the Trinity or more than one God. Now the Almoravids had already conquered the Hebrews in the Maghrib, Ghana Empire and other places in Africa where Hebrews had settled. Some were forced to convert to monotheism, others fled to other parts of the world, and some went to Spain only to be forced to convert to Christianity by the Castilian and Aragonese empires. The Jews strived nonetheless. The Jews have always been in Europe. They were the first from the earliest of times. Then came the Hebrews when the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed and many times when they were deported and later allowed to return. So now, the history of the Jews and Hebrews accomplishments in Spain 
have been partially erased. Let's briefly take a look at the Hebrews' accomplishments in Spain. The Jews' population had so increased in that city that they spread and built the towns of Escalona, Noves, Nombleca, and the present Tombleek, which they had named Bethlehem. Toledo is also said to have been built by them on their first establishment in that country, to which they gave the name of Toledo, and later called by Hebrew writers of the Middle Ages Toletola, which was probably a name given to it by the Moors who held possession of it for centuries, or a corruption of its Latin name Toletanum. There were many structures, cities, among other accomplishments by the Jews, yet we have no accounts of the Hebrew philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers, historians, grammarians, physicians, theologians, jurists, and poets of that period. Their names are unknown, but they must have existed that produced so many who in after ages illustrated the peninsula and rendered it so famed for learning at a time when the rest of Europe was veiled in superstition and ignorance and when it could boast of no other literature than monkish legends that were unknown beyond the places they were penned. Jewish rabbins occupied the highest chairs of philosophy and mathematics in the renowned Moorish schools of Cordova and Toledo, even in England, the first schools were experimental philosophy, geometry, algebra, and logic were taught was that of the Jews at Oxford in the reign of Henry I. We have yet to hear of the Hebrew teachers in the Hebrew names of Moses Hall and Jacob Hall. By them was the philosophy of the ancients made known to Europe. Their knowledge of the skies were from the earliest of times to watch and observe the course of the planetary systems. Their attention was increasingly directed to all the secret mysteries of nature and they may be classed among the earliest astronomers. In medicine they excelled. Various causes combined to give them this preeminence. Their industry had rendered them masters of commerce. They travelled more than other people and their knowledge of foreign languages led them to seek in Greece and the ruins of the Roman Empire for ancient manuscripts. They knew where the choicest drugs were to be found and how best to preserve them. Their close connection with the East and with Spain, which had become the center of Arabian medicine, made them the chosen physicians of kings, princes, popes, and nobles. In preference to others, the Arabian medicine was the offspring of the Jewish, yet some historians have unjustly confounded them, giving the Arabics the honor that belongs to the Jews. The Spanish Hebrews educated at Cordova, Toledo, and Zara furnished masters to the celebrated schools of Montpellier and Salerno. Europe has scarcely acknowledged, much less repaid the debt she owes to the illustrious Hebrew schools of Spain. They appear in that country not only to have to have been cultivators and possessors of the soil, but numerous wealthy, respected and honored by its other inhabitants. The Jews were prosperous and lived fairly well. There were only few sanctions against them. It was not until when Gregory who then filled the papal see, desired that the concessions that had been granted to the Jews should be observed. He imprisoned many of the most wealthy and sanctioned the murder of those who would not embrace Christianity. Many Hebrews abandoned all they possessed to preserve their faith and emigrated to that part of Gaul occupied by the Franks. Others passed over to Africa. It is also said that 90,000 Hebrews received baptism to escape the horrors 
that awaited them if they refused Christianity. Even though many baptized, they still practiced their Hebrew religion in secret. There were many laws enacted on the Hebrews during the various councils of Toledo. You had the Visigoth Code, which we can cover in another lesson. However, no Jews were allowed, was in any way or manner abandoned the holy Christian faith. No person shall impugn it by word or deed, nor attack it either secretly or overtly. No Jew shall in the future think to return to his errors and excommunicated religion. No one shall imagine, utter, or by any act publish the deceitful religion of the Jews. No Jew shall celebrate his Passover on the fourteenth day of any month, nor make holidays on the day they have been accustomed to, nor observe any of the great or minor festivals. No one in the future shall observe the festivals, Sabbath, or other feast. Those were just a few religious laws against the Hebrews. There were other laws such as no Hebrew or Jew were allowed to marry a Christian. The Hebrews had many laws enacted against them, but notwithstanding the decrees of councils, the clergy sold their slaves to the Hebrews, and the trade was so openly carried on that the 10th Council of Toledo, held in 656, found it necessary to enact a canon against such traffic. No, the question is, whom were the slaves sold to the Hebrews of Spain by the clergies? Where were they from? Were they the Hebrews of the conquered Ghana Empire and other conquered territories of Africa? If so, that would be Hebrews sold to Hebrews. On the death of Recess Vinthus in 672, Wamba, against his will, was forced by the nobles and clergy to accept the crown. He found his Jewish subjects numerous, for during the tranquility they had enjoyed for some years, they had greatly increased, to which their early marriages and active life mainly contributed. As the new king was obliged to take the prescribed oath and to order all converted Jews to be expelled from the kingdom, the decree was rigidly executed. Some went to Africa, and numbers who would not submit to baptism passed the Pyrenees and sought an asylum in Narbonne and Gascony, where they were kindly received. During his reign, the Saracens made their first attempt against Spain, but this attacked his bravery. Defeated, recovering from the effects of poison administered at the instigation of Ervig, who dazzled by the brilliancy of a diadem sought his death. He retired to a monastery in 680, abdicating with pleasure to his ambitions rival a throne he had been forced to occupy. To secure his ill-acquired dignity, Ervig in 681 assembled the 12th Council of Toledo where he basically approved the continuation of all the regulations promulgated by the previous princes against the Hebrews. So Wamba died for a crown he never wanted, a crown that was forced upon him. Ervig was more than happy to see him retire, where he quickly enacted the 12th Council of Toledo. Now, the duty of identifying or distinguishing Jews belonged solely to the priest. There were penalties that priests and magistrates incur for delaying executing the laws against the Jews. Witiza became regal power after his father Ejica in 71. He was the sole sovereign of Spain. Brighter prospects opened for the peninsula. He sought to heal the wounds, tyranny, and persecution that was inflicted on the Jews of Spain for more than three centuries. He reduced the taxes. He recalled those whom his father had banished. He reinstated them in their honors and offices and restored their property. 
that no remembrance of the accusation against them might remain. He ordered the proceedings to be burnt and permitted the Jews who had been forcibly baptized to return to their Hebrew religion. Thousands returned to their abandoned homes and country endeared to them by long residence. So sudden a transition and love for the Jewish people and the enjoyment of peace raised many enemies against him. Roderick was elected king by the assistance of the Romans. He defeated the army of Witiza, whom he took prisoner, and after depriving him of his sight, he was confined till he retired. It seems to me only a few people voluntarily wanted to enact laws against the Jews and Hebrews. It appears that many were forced. The newly elected king, Roderick, gave the rein to his passions and violated the beautiful Florida, daughter of Count Julian. Count Julian was said to be the governor of the Gothic possessions in Mauritania. On learning the insult and dishonor offered to his noble family, the enraged father conspired to deliver the southern promontory of Spain where he commanded to the Moors or the Almoravids. In other words, he invited the Moors to take control of southern Spain and the Moors were anxious to revenge the war of Wamba. Briefly, so Count Julian was very upset that Roderick refused his daughter Florida and felt his family was insulted and dishonored. With vengeance, he invited the Moors to conquer Spain. Here, we have the Africans and Byzantine Europeans working together. Roderick had wielded the scepter for two years when the Moors' army came to arouse him from his stupor and licentious pleasures. He hastily assembled an army to check the victorious African chieftains. The forces met at Jerez de la Frontier, which went on for eight days. The Moors were triumphant. So briefly, the Moors' army was led by Tariq ibn Zayad, also called Gormund. He crossed with his main forces and defeated Roderick in the year 711 on the Guadalete River near Arcas de la Frontera. Some say Roderick perished and other historians say he escaped or fled to Wales. The African leader Gormund or Tariq ibn Zayad is said to have burnt the city Jerez to the ground with birds. No, after the Visigoth Empire was annihilated by the Moors, the Moorish banner flew from one extremity of the Iberian Peninsula to the other. No, as to why the Moors did not inflict the same treatment on the Hebrew Spaniards as they did the Maghrib or the Ghanan Empire is unknown to me. But now we will see that they all lived in harmony during the Moors' control of Spain. Town after town surrendered to their indomitable arms. They garrisoned the principal cities of Seville, Cordova, Granada, with Moors and Jews. Jews, Moors, and Hebrews who had converted to Christianity lived together in harmony. Churches were built for Christians. Mosques and synagogues were established. Everyone respected each other's religion and customs. As soon as the Moors were settled in their conquest, the conformity of manners, opinions, sentiments, and even similarities of language brought numbers of Jews once more to the peninsula to partake of their prosperity and science. They were freely allowed to practice their worship that their Christian rulers had imputed to them as a crime. Now their only rivalry, that with the Moors, was learning, both united in the dissemination of knowledge. Foreigners flocked from all parts to receive instructions at the renowned Hebrew and Arabian schools of Cordova, for both flourished greatly under the protection of the Moors. So the Moors were considered the deliverers of the Jews. Some say the Jews prayed for the success of the Moors, and others say the Jews hailed the invaders as their deliverers. 
which the Jews say was worse than the bondage in Egypt. Only a few of the Visigoths escaped the carnage of the bloody field of Herez. They fled to the mountains where under Pelage, a scion of the royal race, they formed a small Christian sovereignty, the capital of which was Oviedo, and their successors, after some time of constant warfare, regained inch by inch the land the Saracens had taken from them. The Gothic prince and his handful of adherents compelled to devote their whole attention and study to the war against the Moors. Ignorant of commerce and unaccustomed to industrial pursuits, they required the enterprising genius of the Jews to furnish them the means of existence. They therefore left them unmolested for some time, and though less fortunate than their brethren in the south, they lived in tranquility and ultimately became valuable assistance to the Castilian crown. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Take care.